The Free Star Collective. Simple rebels pulling away from authority like a child wanting independence. Or revolutionaries standing up for the future of countless generations at the expense of their own comforts and securities. Much of their story is unknown, but there are several breadcrumbs that lead us into very interesting observations about Starfield's Free Star Collective. Why did the Free Star Collective forsake the ambition of expansion for the preservation of the human spirit? And maybe a better question, were the unintended consequences worth it? Welcome everyone to Starfield Signal, your place for everything Starfield. I am your host, Luke, and this is our second entry into our Lore Spec series, where we explore the known lore of Starfield and add a bit of speculation for flavor. This video featuring the Free Star Collective is connected to the United Colonies video, so I invite you to watch that one first if you haven't already done so. You can click or tap the card at the top of the screen to go there now. And a quick reminder to hit the like button as that helps other Starfield fans find this video and contribute towards our awesome community. Let's start again with what we know from official sources. The Free Star Collective are a loose confederation of three distinct star systems within our galaxy. Their capital, Aquila City, was founded in 2167, just six years after New Atlantis was established, which is now capital to the United Colonies. Now, we don't know exactly when the Free Star Collective declared their confederation, but we do know they engaged in what is known as the Colony Wars with the United Colonies in the year 2310. As of the year 2330, it's said the Free Star Collective and the United Colonies now enjoy an uneasy peace indicating some sort of formal resolution was made, but the relational scars are still healing. The Free Star Rangers are the specific group in these colonies who take on this peacekeeping role, evidently protecting its citizens from galactic threats in addition to natural predators, which the Aquila City security wall aids in as well. And this is about all we know for sure. However, as I mentioned earlier, if you'll allow me a bit of speculation, I think there are some really interesting dynamics here. If we read between the lines of what we know, we just might uncover why the Free Star Collective risked everything to stand against the United Colonies. To build out this argument, I'm going to start with where we might guess the Free Star Collective systems are located in relation to the United Colonies. From there, we'll draw some reasonable assumptions as to what role these systems originally had with the UC and finally, we'll speculate more about what brought these systems to take such a defiant stance against their founders. And this is really the heart of what I want to get to, but I do have an extra layer I want to explore that looks into what might have been an unintended consequence of the rebellion, which will lead us into our next video. So be sure to stick around till the end for that. A quick reminder to like and subscribe. We also invite you to our Discord to join us on this Starfield journey. If you're loving the content and want to support the channel, you can do that through our Patreon or YouTube channel memberships. Check out all of those links in the description. Okay, if you're still with us at this point, then you've probably already seen this screenshot. This is the Starfield lead game designer working on a United Colonies memo concerning the Crimson Fleet. I think this is relevant here because of the phrasing this memo has in relation to the Free Star Collective. It says this, Pirates of the Crimson Fleet have extended far beyond the Crix system and have established footholds in the Sagan, Cheyenne, Lunara, and Narion systems. Both System Defense and the Vanguard are committed to ridding United Colony space of these parasites. This is clearly no longer just a Free Star Collective problem. I feel like this gives us some hints as to where the Free Star Collective systems might be, the last part of this memo excerpt says this is no longer a Free Star Collective problem, indicating that at one time, the United Colonies did in fact observe the fleet as only a Free Star Collective problem. Going back into the details of the memo, it first mentions the fleet have extended far beyond the Crix system and have established footholds in Sagan, Cheyenne, Lunara, and Narion. I believe this may point to one of the Free Star Collective systems being the Crix system. And these other systems are all part of the United Colonies closest to the Free Star Collective, where this threat seemed to originate. I wanted to see if I could test this hypothesis in the Starfield Navigator program, but unfortunately, the only systems referenced here that are actually documented in the program are Cheyenne and Narion. 
The Crix, Sagan, and Lunara systems aren't yet identified in any of the marketing we've seen. Even still, we could safely assume that these systems are somewhere in between the Freestar Collective and Alpha Centauri. With this in mind, we could speculate at least some of these systems were most likely established before Aquila City in 2167. This is important because it tells us the United Colonies have settled several systems and planets before it founded Aquila City. Therefore, these systems were established with a firm role in mind to not only become self-sustainable, but to support the continued expansion of the United Colonies. Now, we dive in a little deeper to the speculation. I'm going to postulate that Aquila City, specifically, was initially founded as a hunting outpost. The evidence I'll present for this is found in the Aquila City Location Insight video. The lead designer says the people of Aquila City believe in the security of personal freedom and individuality. He continues to note the walls of Aquila City protect them from deadly alien predators, the Osta, which he says are a cross between a wolf and a velociraptor. So bear with me as I connect these ideas to support my hunting outpost theory. First, you might argue that just because there are natural predators here, that doesn't mean Aquila City is a hunting outpost. And sure, that's true, it could have been established as a mining or farming outpost, or maybe with the intention of exporting some other natural resource. However, from the few glimpses we do get of Aquila City, it doesn't seem to have a strong industrial presence you might assume a mining operation to have, nor do we see any evidence of farming or greenhouses to take advantage of the hydroponics technology we know they'll use in the Starfield universe. What we do see is a frontier-like village with more of a military vibe, but not like we noted in the United Colonies in New Atlantis, but more of this space western fantasy kind of militia feel, where everyone has their own protection. I also believe their value of individual freedom matches with the kind of persona a hunting village fosters. People who grow up on the frontier, in the mountains, or in far removed regions of civilization often have a very rugged outlook on life. They value individual freedom because they grew up learning how to take care of themselves. They don't operate in a mindset of a corporal system taking care of them because they've been forced by their environment to kind of figure it out for themselves. Now, this doesn't mean they don't value community. It's just that their communities are always in close proximity and have grounded and tangible ways in which they support each other, which may be why the systems of the Freestar Collective consider themselves a confederation, loosely supporting and cooperating with each other while maintaining their own sovereignty. So what could have brought these three different star systems to the point where they banded together to defy the will of the United Colonies? As with most wars, we might assume one of the big three reasons, resources, political power, or ideology. If we run with the theory that Aquila City started as a hunting outpost, let's connect that with resources. I imagine one of two scenarios playing out to finally bring the two sides to war. First, it could have been as simple as the United Colonies refusing to negotiate fair prices for these systems' resources. After all, if the United Colonies invested in the development of these outposts and communities, then they must have felt they could dictate the value of their work and exports. Through heavy-handed negotiations, minimal pay, overbearing tariffs, and strong-arm tactics, the UC finally pushed the Freestar Collective Systems past their breaking point. Or two, the United Colonies might have been providing decent financial compensation and support for the systems, but their steadily increasing demand for a constantly diminishing supply threatened the natural ecosystems of these outposts. With nothing to keep the United Colonies' expansion in check, their ambition for growth was threatening the sustainability of these systems by draining them of their natural resources past the point of equilibrium. This in turn would have threatened the very home these settlers would have built over the last 150 years, giving them no choice but to either abandon their home or fight for it. And so they did. Whatever the reason, wherever the tipping point, blood was spilled. And though the colony wars didn't seem to last long, this next chapter in human history remains stained with its legacy. Even now, as we settle into this uneasy peace between the two factions, the consequences will be felt for generations to come. While the lost lives and torn communities war always brings with it are scars enough, there are other consequences. 
faint sounds of the first few dominoes falling that will eventually lead to the ideal circumstances for what could be a much darker threat. Chaos.